Excellent. Okay. Um, so please drop all of your questions into the Q&A chat. Um, you can begin doing so at any time. Um, you might not see it come up immediately, but it will be displayed when it's being answered. Um, we have two moderators today who will ask your question for you during the Q&A portion. Um, and finally, please keep all questions and behavior appropriate. Uh, anyone who is being disrespectful or rude will be removed from the event. Um, so uh, an outline for today. Uh, first, we will have Brooke giving us an introduction and a brief history of Bridge and what we do. Um, and following Brooke, we will have a panel and Q&A portion with our panelists, Sangha, Nadia, and Roseanne, who will tell you uh, a bit more about themselves and answer any questions you have um, or questions that were submitted prior to the panel. Um, and a reminder that this is also being recorded in case you need to leave early um, or if you have someone that you would like to share this panel with after the fact. Um, and so with that, uh, we'll pass it off to Brooke to get us started. Great. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm going to give a quick presentation just about the origination and history of Bridge, um, and then we'll pass it on to our lovely panelists that can really expand more on specific questions. Um, so as I pull up my PowerPoint, let's see, here we are. Um, so. Uh, Bridge is a graduate student run and organized uh, program that aims to increase the representation and visibility of early career scientists, specifically among underrepresented groups, and in large part to help combat attrition of underrepresented graduate students. Uh, Bridge does this by inviting early career uh, scholars to the UMass campus um, to, to give not just the traditional academic talk, but to also really expand on the ways in which academia can encourage uh, mentorship um, around uh, many different uh, issues, as well as to encourage um, broader impacts and thinking really critically and thoughtfully about how our work as scholars impacts different communities. So uh, across uh, fields, STEM has a diversity problem um, and the lack of representation of different identity uh, identities is, is a big part, uh, is a big challenge, not only because of the ways in which it um, uh, hurts our own communities, but also the way it hurts um, our production of knowledge. And so we can see this uh, across UMass um, and in part bridge came out of the geoscience program and recognizing that um, not just the invited speakers, but also postdocs and faculty were um, not fully representing uh, important identities. And so here you see just representation of gender across five years in the geoscience department. Um, the bridge founders are, are se several which are here as panelists um, and today uh, come from many different fields. So geoscience, environmental conservation, and certainly has expanded now um, with our current uh, committee. Uh, Raquel Bryant and Benjamin Kessling are now alumni. Um, they are both postdocs, I believe, um, at Texas AM University as well as Columbia, and continue to, to do the type of work that, that Bridge um, wishes to uphold in the world. So I think they recently received as co-founders uh, NSF award to uh, work on professional teams for DIE. Um, and so Bridge has started about three years ago and, and really continues to have increasing impact, not just on the UMass, uh, campus, but across other universities as well. So as I mentioned before, Bridge is a, a unique program in that it, it invites scholars to come and not just provide one talk, um, a formal scientific talk. Um, though we do have that, we also um, make sure to include two other important talks uh, as, as separate events. So one, the Bridge to Impacts um, can have a different format. It could be a talk or it could be a panel like this. And it's really geared to thinking about the broader impacts um, of academic work and that scholar's academic work to the rest of the community. Um, and on the Bridge website, you can actually find reflections that are short essays that write up um, some of the impacts that um, have, have taken place through Bridge scholars. Um, and finally, there's also Bridge to Students. And this is a, usually a smaller event really focused to graduate students um, to meet and discuss more openly and frankly in conversation with um, our scholars how to navigate academia and specifically navigating it um, through uh, the lens of underrepresented identities. So uh, now almost two, three years uh, existing, Bridge takes place in, in three departments in graduate programs. So this is the psychological and brain science, uh, as well as the interdepartment graduate program, um, neuroscience also being housed between those two, and the School of Earth and Sustainability. 
Um, this is kind of an illustration of Bridges organization. So um, we're lucky to have a really robust steering committee um, that meets regularly and anyone uh, can join these meetings. And that would look at overall logistics like planning this seminar, developing the website. Um, but within each of the different departments that, that Bridge operates, we also really depend on um, the students within those departments to understand and, the, and develop the logistics that makes the most sense for the departments, recognizing that some of the um, financial components or actual invitations of scholars will um, depend on the specific field. Um, but as you can see, we have a really uh, amazing crew of people working together, um, and we hope to, to continue to expand that as well. Um, the funding for Bridge has operated um, pretty flexibly and continues to, to be mindful of uh, uh, the current conversations around the coronavirus and how that impacts which Brid what Brid Bridge looks like and how it may look like in the future. So before um, this year, so in 2019 and 2020, um, funding for Bridge was um, divided between a few different places. So one, the um, Institute of Diversity Science was um, paying usually for scholars travel. So actually being able to come to UMass as well as um, uh, the housing as well. Um, whereas the CNS Graduate Diversity Fund um, would help um, contribute to, um, for the impacts and students in person would always have a food component as well. Um, and as you can see, some of the indi individual departments themselves would also, in some cases, contribute money. And so this would, again, really depend on department specific logistics. Um, and I think in the last year, uh, many of the, the bridge teams were able to get uh, memorandums of understanding to get their departments to commit to contributing money um, on a more annual basis. At the same time, of course, this past year has looked quite differently now that we've not been able to have in-person uh, conversations. Um, and so we really made a focal uh, attempt to make sure that the money that would have been going for travel and housing um, is really based around fair and uh, uh, robust honorariums, which we've been able to provide our two um, uh, scholars for this past fall. And, and that is now something that we have extended into the future, that at, at a minimum, all, um, all scholars that we invite would have a $500 honorarium for the three talks. Um, we continue to discuss as we move forward what talks will look like in the next, uh, the next uh, even spring semester, as well as in the future, when hopefully we can go back to, to having these in-person events as well. So um, this past uh, fall semester, we had two bridge scholars, Dr. Fantasy Lozada, who was hosted um, in the psychological and brain science department, as well as Dr. Kofi Boone, who was hosted in the landscape and architecture um, uh, program. Although of course, um, individuals could come from uh, any of those different, uh, any program to come and be a part of the audience. And we really encourage um, you to go to any of the bridge talks, regardless if it's in your field or not. So uh, with these two uh, amazing scholars, Bridge has now hosted 16 scholars across uh, many different programs and has been recognized in uh, many different ways for, for the, the work that they're doing. Um, and so finally, I think the, the main goal of the next section, the Q&A, is to help make Bridge more accessible um, to you and your department and thinking about how to expand it um, uh, to different domains within UMass, as well as potentially engage conversations with other universities that are already starting to recognize Bridge as a really unique and innovative program. And so I encourage you to um, get to social media, follow Bridge on Twitter, um, visit the website, and then uh, ask questions today and and, and really enjoy um, the panelists and I think the information that they have. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it back to our two moderators, um, Sarah McCormick um, and Leanne and let them continue on. Great, thank you, Brooke. Um, so now we'll start with the panel portion of today's event. Um, and three of our committee members here, uh, Sangha, Nadia, and Roseanne will be your panelists today. Uh, again, if you have questions, please put them into the question and answer window and we will get to it. And here are our panelists who will introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Nadia Fernandez and I am a PhD student in the Environmental Conservation Department. And my research focuses on um, using genomics to understand um, a fish, freshwater fish species called the Golden Dorado in South America and understand how short-term and long-term um, impacts structure the way their populations are distributed. 
Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Roseanne, and I am a PhD student in microbiology. My research focuses on obligate intracellular bacteria, particularly chlamydia. It's not just an STD, that's a PSA. Um, and particularly, my project is focused on um, epitheliocystis in fish, uh, which is caused by a chlamydia like organism, but we're trying to figure out what exactly is going on. Hi everyone, my name is Sangha. Um, I am a PhD student in clinical psychology in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences, and I study ADHD and related externalizing behavior disorders, specifically how they're identified and diagnosed in racial and ethnic minority children. All right, I, I don't believe we've had any questions come in through the Q&A yet, so, so please continue to do so. Um, I'll, I'll pose a question to the panelists uh, just to sort of get us going. Um, so if, if I'm a graduate student and I can't commit to, to regular meetings, can I still be involved? The answer is yes. <laughs> I think we just see, saw these questions. Um, if you're a graduate student, you're absolutely um, able to get involved as long as um, others in your department also come to our steering committee meetings and um, touch base about what's going on within the central bridge committee and uh, communicate what's going on with your departmental bridge committees as well. Yeah, I, I can add to that. And I think we've had um other graduate students within departments who ne weren't necessarily on the committee, but were very much helping hands in setting up the events and the more helping hands, the better. Um, and it's something we really appreciate. And um, it's definitely been done to, to help, but not be, you know, um, if you don't have the time to commit. Yeah, and add to what Nadia said, um, when you're hosting a scholar, which we might get into this in, in a bit, but um, when you're hosting a scholar, there's a lot of moving parts that go into it and so you can have people other graduate students who may not necessarily be fully affiliated with bridge but to help out um, with the actual event uh, the events themselves it's really helpful um, and we're always interested in having more people be a part of bridge so it's a plug looks like we have a question that came in um, how did we decide the honorarium amount um, it looks like the person's department is resistant to providing um, honorarium to speakers. Um, we didn't, we, we talked about it a lot as a committee um, and in light of everything being done remotely um, during COVID, before we would cover the cost of the, the speaker to come, um, so their travel accommodations and then food and things like that for the events. Um, but obviously, if we're doing this remotely, we still want to compensate the speakers for their time. Um, and so it's three separate events. And so we felt that 500 was a good baseline amount. Um, and I know for microbio, for example, we don't generally give an honorarium, um, but it's something that's important that we want to make sure that we're, we're compensating these people for their time. Um, and so, you know, moving forward, once we're able to go back to being in person, I think us as a committee would really like to be able to just cover the cost of the scholar's visit and then still provide that honorarium. Um, but every department is different in terms of what they do for, for an honorarium, but we are trying to keep things consistent. And so 500 was the number that we, we came up with. Yeah, and I think we, I can say that that was a, you know, a conversation of us, you know, all like Brooke illustrated in the in the slides, we're all at different departments and we're all in different programs and, and under like just, communicating what the um, honorarium is looks like across different departments and then thinking about the requirements that we ask, you know, the events, it's not just a science talk, it's another event too, it's two other events, you know, the um, interacting with the students and then doing the impacts talk and then usually their schedule is filled as well, so it's an entire day, but we also are you know, thinking about that is that it's just not one event that they're hosting that they are, you know, hosting three events and then, you know, kind of taking into account that the impacts talk also is, is work, but then it also is, can be like some emotional labor too. And, and we talk about compensating for um, folks who talk about, particularly who come from marginalized groups to, to speak. Um, 
talk about compensation. And so that, that was something we, we thought about quite a bit um, and talked about and, and what we thought was fair, uh, not fair, well, what we thought was better than, than what's usually offered. Um, yeah. We have another question. Um, does Bridge cover all costs of hosting the Bridge speaker or is it a collaboration with the hosting department or program? So Bridge as a student organization, I don't think there's any funds associated with like the bridge itself. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we have gotten support from the Institute of Diversity Sciences in collaboration and they provided the funds. And um, I think all of our departments have committed to a certain number of amount of funding to host Bridge Scholars per year. So um, it's mostly supported by our departmental funds and partially through CNS, I believe, too. Yeah, I think you're right, Sankha. Okay. There's, <laughs> also, there's multiple parts to it, um, but that's part of the one of the, that's one of the things that in the um, memorandum of understanding is, I can't even say that right, <laughs> to um, have, um, to, to establish that, to make an agreement on the kind of like the baseline of, of future scholars and what's going to be funded. And, and that's taking into account how much we have generally seen the cost to be um, when we've brought in past scholars. And I also wanted to add that we did get some startup funds, I think, from the Institute of Diversity Sciences. Um, and also we've received some support through um, CNS. And then we also have raised money ourselves uh, through a minute fund campaign, which we did last year, which was very successful. Um, but overall, it's a collaboration between the hosting department and then bridge. So there are certain certain components that are funded through the, the funds that we have. So I think like, for one of the talks, like the refreshments are covered by by bridge by the money that we have. But overall, the, the majority of the cost is is taken on by the, the hosting department. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, coming in from the Q&A. So are there specific areas or departments that are in need of help or representation through Bridge? What types of tasks could or would these graduate students who maybe can't commit to regular meetings be responsible for? I think that there is definitely um... You know that's that's part of the one of the reasons why we wanted to hold this event because we recognize that there um, there are other departments that don't have any bridge members in yet, and we wanted to see if we can can reach out and using this platform um, to hopefully gain some interest. Um, and I I think that you know even if it's you know maybe the time commitment's not available right now, but I think even just engaging with our community is a start in in starting to if it's you know. Um, making meetings every now and then, but at least engaging with us um, in the discussions of how events go and then kind of seeing, especially coming this spring, a lot of our bridge scholars are gonna be coming um, and just, it, they're welcome to also sit in the meetings and just hear about the process that we go through. Um, and then it's a matter of if they wanna take it on, but it's one of those things that the more helping hands you have, the lighter the work is. So if there's a couple of students from certain departments where bridge rep representation isn't, um, they're welcome to join the meetings. And then maybe if it seems like something it's doable um, for them and they, they're willing to take it on, then that's something that we will definitely help with. And I think that's another thing that, um, you know, as me, a couple of the founding bridge members are still involved with bridge, it's, it's very much like, um, like sort of like trainings in some sense of the new members and, and helping them go through the, the process and you know the growing pains in their own department. Um, and if we don't have the answer, we're, we're all kind of helping hands to figure it out together. Just to add to that um, very quickly, uh, it has made a tremendous difference to have a small group of people um, coming from the department. So it shouldn't be an individual task and I couldn't have done it alone. Um, so I would say, select a group of peer peer graduate students who are dedicated and willing to take put in the time and energy to do this and that would make a huge difference than trying to take it on yourself. 
I would also add that um, I know there are a few departments even within CNS that don't we currently don't have any bridge representation for it, but we would love to have um, and maybe if if you're in one of those departments that doesn't currently have bridge representation, maybe you could help us identify some people who would be potentially interested in being part of bridge um, in terms of graduate students. But I also wanted to say that, you know, in addition to the important work that we're trying to do here, I will say that one personal positive benefit is that being a part of bridge has helped me create friendships with people outside of my department that I normally wouldn't interact with. And I think that's one of the really nice things about Bridge as well is that it's a community um, of graduate students and you know grad school can be very you can feel very siloed um, in your department in your lab etc and so being on Bridge is a really positive experience because you get to interact with people from all sorts of departments and learn all you know learn different things and collaborate um, so that's another huge benefit I think of being being um, a part of Bridge as a graduate student. Wonderful, thank you. Um, another question coming in. Um, so there are many groups uh, that are underrepresented in the sciences and sometimes this is particularly evident in departments um, such as physics, astronomy and mathematics. Um, so do we have any students from these areas participating in Bridge um, and if not, how can they get involved? I don't think we have you can correct me wrong. I don't think we have current representation from those departments or those programs. Um, and I guess if whoever asked the question is a faculty member or is another grad student or is affiliated with these departments, um, I think that you can reach out to out, reach out to us. I think we have sent a couple of we tried to have different um, emails go out to kind of advertise about Bridge, but it's likely that it's not going, you know, everywhere we want it to go. But um, let us let us know, and we can um, either craft another email, and or um, if there's any like recommendations on on folks that you think might be interested. Um, that's some. I think that's how we've gotten a couple couple of the departments interested. Is just um, some faculty members kind of promoting it a little bit of like, hey, graduate students, this is um, a program that's happening, as opposed to kind of. Uh, a wide casting email through like CNS. So um, yeah, if you can reach out to us, I think that's, uh, and let us know um, which department you're in and in what, you know, uh, areas to connect and what ways are to connect and we can have a discussion about it. Great, thank you. Um, Another question coming in. So uh, would Bridge or does Bridge in, uh, include inviting graduate students and postdocs from other institutions as a way to promote rising scholars from underrepresented groups? Um, do you collaborate with similar programs at other institutions? I think um, we've, <laughs> go ahead, Roseanne. Uh, I was just going to say we haven't we haven't currently invited any graduate students from other institutions, but postdocs are certainly welcome um, and um, alternative careers. So um, folks don't have to be in academia. Um, they can be from industry or a variety of different things. Um, but the whole point is that we're trying to bring early you know, representation to early career scientists. Um, and so obviously you are early career as a graduate student, but our focus is more to create a um, a space in which graduate students can talk with near peer people to see, okay, this is what it's like on the other side. Um, but that's an interesting question to think about hosting graduate students. In terms, I think there was a second part to the question if we've linked with other organizations um, across campuses. We, we haven't yet. Um, uh, a, a, like of other like like programs that are happening, but we are currently in talks with folks who are interested in implementing a, a bridge program or like program in their um, universities and departments. So that's, um, and this isn't, you know, this has been kind of a conversation that's been happening for a while of kind of interest in us doing that. So we're starting to, to get to work on that of what it looks like to, um, uh, 
I'm mean, necessarily like set up some sort of workshop or set up um, uh, materials that can help in, in kind of for us to be able to help other institutions and programs. But I think there are other programs, at least recently that I've been attending conferences and interacting with other grad students and um, we're not at UMass. And it sounds like there's kind of some similar um, initiatives by graduate students. Um, so I think that um, eventually, you know, as we are bridges like presented at different, has been presented at different conferences and I think will continue to be presented at different conferences. So I think there will be opportunities to see if we can kind of also link up with other um, like initiatives and, and have discussions and, and learn from each other and stuff. Excellent. Um, another question for the whole panel. So how has this work sustained you? Have you personally benefited? I would say emotionally, yes. I don't think there's a quantifiable way for us to um, look back and you know measure up the ways by which that we have benefited. But I think um, both um, emotionally, this has been really good um, in terms of you know reminding myself why this work is important and um, being in community with a great group of graduate students who also believe that this work is important. And um, I think for the sense of community and also for the sense of like where my career should go and connecting with Bridge Scholars and learning from that and learning from them in that way also has been really tremendously beneficial personally, I would say. I agree with uh, Sangha. I think that the benefits are kind of immeasurable from a personal standpoint, both being able to interact with scholars that you wouldn't necessarily normal, normally have the ability to interact with in a very personal way, um, I think is really great. Um, and then also just being able to, to interact with, with the other people in Bridge is, has been really beneficial for me. And you know, we have uh, regular meetings. And so during COVID, you know, sometimes our meetings, we don't have anything planned, but we'll just still talk you know have a meeting and talk about what's going on and i think that that also helps to feel less isolated particularly in these crazy times i agree with everything they both just said and i have nothing else to add <laughs> great thanks um we have another question that's kind of multi-part um so i'll ask it in a few different bits um but generally, how many scholars are hosted per semester? And has there been a recent model for integration of new departments? Example, new department contributes X and that enables one to two speakers. I think I can answer the first part. So um, I think right now for all the programs that are in, in departments that are involved with Bridge, I might be wrong, um, that each have committed to hosting at least one scholar per academic year. Um, and that can change um, in terms of, it could increase to, to two scholars per year, but that's an agreement that's made based on the budget that is um, agreed upon for Bridge Scholars and also with the department um, and, and what they're able to do. So, um, Right now, in terms of how many scholars are hosted per semester is entirely dependent on the structure of the um, department and the program that they're being hosted in. Because some scholars, some um, departmental seminar series are planned out one academic year, like before, you know, they plan for the whole academic year, whereas other um, departmental seminar series plan like per semester. And I think that we have to take that into account too of when you're able to submit um, when you're able to submit a scholar's name and and to fulfill that spot. So it's kind of a, a working progress and especially with COVID happening, that was something that we were also trying to to work around is what um, what was feasible for us for the fall and then which kind of led us to have kind of a, a busier spring for bridge scholars. But we knew we knew that and made the agreement of that going in. Um, so it, it's a, it depends on the departments and the programs. Um, 
and there's no like set schedule. It's also dependent on the, the graduate students who are hosting in, in what their schedules are like. And if they're particularly busy in one semester, they might plan for the other semester um, to host. I forgot the second, sorry, Leanne. What was the second part of that question? Um, if there's been a recent model for integration of new departments. I don't think I understand um, the question, like whether there's been a recent model for integration of new departments. So I guess like the only thing that we're really host saying is that reach out to us with a group of graduate students who are interested and will help you get started. Is that the integration model that we're, we've been working with? I think maybe we can, um, we can talk about, maybe talk about the recruitment event that we had initially that got us expanding. Mm. Um, so, oh man, when was it? Was it 29th spring of 2019? I can't remember. <laughs> we <laughs> when time was a real thing. Yeah, <laughs> um, we had it a, a a recruitment event as you know we were a small committee at that point it was there was just five of us and that's where we you know a lot of the representation you saw in the in the figure that's where it happened where we had um, an event to talk about what bridge was kind of similar in some sense to this event um, and what it was the what this the work was required and and the steps and what the timelines look like um, and then what talking with the students, what that might look like in their um, department. And, uh, and then we kind of, we broke up into like, you know, some of, all of us are in different departments. So we tried to break it up as, you know, I was, um, I'm in environmental conservation department, but I was talking to the folks who were also in SES department or in the SES program. So that way we kind of have like, like with like, I can kind of talk to their experiences or in terms of also funding, like what their funding might look like too. Um, so it's kind of a, I guess we're, I don't, maybe there is a model that's not formally structured the way that um, it, it might be assumed, but it's, it's kind of like a, what we think of as like recruitment events. And now that we're big enough, we're kind of, um, I think we're kind of gaining interest and in gaining new folks from, I think word of mouth, but also our committee's large and they talk to other students and it just creates this massive network that we can also engage with other departments too. I don't know if I'm answering that question correctly or what they're looking for. Yeah, it seemed like they were just curious about um, how new departments can start um, being involved in Bridge. There's another part of the question. Um, is there a consistent audience, even if the speaker doesn't represent the historical audience attendance? For example, will PBS students attend an engineering scholars talk? Um, that's a good question. So I would say pre-COVID, we didn't have a lot of um, cross-discipline attendance um, in like action, in the in-person events. Um, except for those of us who are a part of Bridge. Um, but with COVID and being online, I think we've seen number one, more attendance from a much broader, um, a much broader audience. Um, and so that's something that we've been talking about too, is once we are able to go back to in person, you know, how can we try to capture, or maintain that, that level of, of cross-discipline um, participation? Um, so, you know, that could be that we have the in-person events, but then the, the events are also broadcast, you know, via Zoom or <clears throat> something like that. And then so someone who is, you know, say in engineering that really wants to attend a talk in microbio, um, they wouldn't necessarily have to come from engineering all the way over to moral. They could be at their desk and still attend the event. Um, so it's something that, you know, we're adapting to uh, with COVID, but I know for all of us, we really want attendance from people from of a vast, um, back, vast backgrounds, um, whether that's graduate students or faculty. Um, but I think we're getting there. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, uh, if I have identified a potential bridge speaker of interest in my program, I don't believe we have hosted a speaker in the past. What should be the next steps? If the speaker accepts the invitation, what is the planning process typically like, considering now it will likely be a virtual seminar? 
If I were in this person's position, I would um, secure funding from the department before extending an invite, um, just to make sure that um, the invitation process and the speaker process, so like the virtual visit process is consistent with the rest of the bridge model. So just to make sure that, you know, they are able to provide the $500 honorarium and um, have the language available to describe to the speaker what um, the different components of the bridge visit bridge visit looks like. I think that also I'm not really sure if this is a question of they were a committee member or not. Um, because if you know, uh, if you're a graduate student and you know that there's other graduate students in your um, in particular PBS that are committee members, I think you can um, talk directly to them and, and reach out to Bridge and be like, who's the PBS representation? You just wanna double check and then reach out directly to them and see like, you know, if you, you propose the name and, you know, we document all the names, the input that we get from, from folks and we have a, an ongoing list and, um, and then ask them if, you know, if that happens to be one of the ones they wanna work with the next year or something like that, how can you be involved? Um, I think it just depends on the on the context of who the person is and, and if they're involved with bridge or not. Um, Leanne, well, there's a second. Sorry, I'm like, is there a second part? There's a second part to that question you asked. Um, just basically what the next steps would be um, in the planning process. What it's typically like, um, particularly for virtual seminars. Somehow, do you want to talk about virtual summer since you just did it with the planning processes like? Yeah, so we had to um, cancel the speaker that was scheduled for spring, the last spring semester, and reschedule the person to Dr. Fanesa Lozada to the fall. And um, we basically described to her that all talks will be hosted um, virtually. And if she's still interested, in having the visit virtually. She agreed um, and we implement, we scheduled her talks to be um, at the same times as two of our, I guess, bigger programs within the psychology department. So clinical psychology and developmental science have the same time for seminars. So we scheduled her science talks for that time so that folks who um, were already mandated to attend could, could attend the science talks. Um, and then we were just kind of, um, we picked times for the students and impact talks and um, advertised those to the department, created a Zoom link. I think I used my personal, not the personal ID, but the generate automatic generation of Zoom links. Um, we also set up potential, or we asked the Bridge Scholar if she is interested in meeting with some faculty who are in our department and we communicated with them that our bridge scholar would like to meet with them. Can you please provide a Zoom link to meet with her? So we kind of outlined um, a table of schedules so that like at this time on this day, you'd be having this talk. And then after that, you'd be meeting with this person kind of thing. I don't know if that's uh, too nitty gritty of the detail, but um, yeah, it was, we just used um, Zoom and advertised it to our department and the bridge listservs. Sanka, did you guys have a faculty member helping you host Dr. Lozada? Mm, I don't think so, no. It was just okay. um, the us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's a, it's um, to their credit, that's, it's a lot of work. And I think anyone who's hosted a, it doesn't have to be a bridge scholar, anyone who's hosted another um, outside speaker is a lot of work to fill in a schedule. Um, but that's also something that we, uh, it kind of depends on the, the on the program and a number of helping hands you have too, um, but sometimes what, what can help. And I think if you're a faculty member on this um, on this call is happy is um, being able to help host a scholar and essentially kind of help fill those uh, those like blank spaces in a schedule where the scholar would like to to meet with other faculty members because that there comes, I think, a, a different dynamic of a faculty member reaching out to other faculty members of like, hey, there's a scholar you want to, do you want to meet with them as opposed to a graduate student kind of asking. Um, 
doesn't have to, you know, it helps, you know, like, like I said, helping many, many hands help. Um, but it's a, it's a great amount of effort. And I think if faculty members are trying to figure out how to support bridge and, um, and help bridge, that's one of the things of, if you know, not just submitting names that you can also note in any names you submit, but also if you are hosting a scholar, if you know your department's hosting a scholar, you can volunteer or say that you are willing to help host in any way. Thanks, Nadia. Just wanna quickly plug that um, all email templates for outreach and communication are shared across the pods. So we call like these different um, department pods in our in Bridge. Um, and we all share those resources. So um, you're not, you wouldn't be alone and you wouldn't have to create the wheel. Thanks. Uh, so that kind of leads us into our next question nicely, um, which is how can departments help strengthen Bridge or aid in facilitating the program? What are some barriers we've identified thus far and that uh, departments can consider working on? Um, I think that a barrier that we've had that I think has gotten better over time is just uh, visibility. At first, people didn't know anything about us. Um, and so we were kind of, you know, cold calling um, to say, hey, this is important and pay attention to us. Um, but at this point, I, I feel like we've, as Nadia kind of alluded to earlier, you know, we've had folks from even other universities that have been paying attention to what we're doing and have reached out to us. And, um, and so that's been, you know, a nice like pat on the back. But I would say that the biggest thing for us is just having, um, you know, faculty support and whether that's like from the department head level or just faculty within each department. I mean, we have been very fortunate to have support from like the Dean of CNS and some other people who are, you know, high up in administration. Um, and so having those people on board is, has definitely been very helpful for us, but um, you know, it's, it's just, it's been a work in progress. I think um, one of the things too is uh, it's gotten, you know, as Roseanne talked about, especially with um, one of the benefits of going virtual was being able to cast the wider net and having a more diverse audience than we originally had in person. Um, but one of the things that we've, I, I think at least uh, can speak to like our department a little bit is like struggled with is just um, I'd say like some, how like some promotion that's not from Bridge, but you know, from, other faculty or um, I guess other folks in the department saying like, hey, this is important, you know, or, or sending an email like, hey, I, I suggest people go. Um, and that's, I think people don't realize how helpful that is as opposed to just getting an, another email that you might, you know, quickly move out of your inbox. Um, it's just getting some, some other vocal support that and visibility, you know, too, that you're supporting something but then if you're able to attend the event too that's even even better because I think um whether you realize it people realize it or not like I definitely pick up on who's attending the events and even if you show up folks show up once like faculty members show up once it's it, it means a lot um and it's you know I, I have it, now I like when I pass them in the hallway it's you know a little I can engage with them in a different way of talking about bridge but um we've had some support you know some of the the, like Roseanne said, like some support from the Dean, but and even our, um, the chairs of our departments, I think when we've went to the bridge to, part, bridge to impacts events, we've had them quite often in the audience too. Um, so that's, you know, important to us is that we're getting support at the higher level for folks who generally, you know, usually have a very busy schedule and they're making time for it. Um, so I guess in some way, if you want to know how to support, I think that um, attending events, but also vocalizing and amplifying the program the best you can um, is really helpful for us because we don't have the same networks. I think that's also something to consider. Thank you. Uh, next question. Have any of the invited scholars given feedback to share how the visit to UMass through the bridge, pro bridge program impacted them. Yeah, 
yes, uh, we have we have a, a survey that we send to the scholars after we posted them to ask them about their experience. It's a short Google form um, and it's anonymous. Um, so they can tell us, they can be brutally honest. But so far, all the feedback that we've gotten was th been that this is a very unique platform and that they were very impressed with, you know, how, how, the, how the events were executed and, and just being able to engage with graduate students and with different people that they wouldn't normally be able to communicate or engage with um, if it was just a traditional science talk. Um, and, you know, anecdotally, I know that there have been scholars that we've hosted before that when faculty tenure track positions have come up, those scholars have applied for those positions and then even also indicated that one of the reasons they were interested in that position was because of their interaction with um, the graduate students who are hosting them. Uh, so I think it's been, it's a mutually beneficial situation both for the scholar and for the people who are hosting and for the UMass community at large um, because you know it's an invited talk that they get to put onto their CV um, and it also gives them a chance to you know get their name out there more than than what they might have as an early career scientist. So um, it's it's amazing. I have nothing to add. All right, uh, we'll move on to the next question then. Uh, do you have a bridge events calendar to which people can subscribe? That's a great idea. We don't. <laughs> um, events calendar. I think um, that would be beneficial for um, us, the central like steering committee members too, but um, we currently do not have a calendar. And I think that could be something easy to add onto the website. Or maybe I'm un underestimating <laughs> what that'll take. I think we had, we had, we're, you know, one of the benefits of expanding the community or the committee is the, the folks who are working like on the website and re clearing up and stuff. I think at one point we had a calendar and then it was a matter of, we didn't have, you know, all the things to do. That was something that wasn't always, it was something that always we forget about. Um, I don't know if it's still on there, but there is some, we are in discussion about talking about like a bridge listserv um, to, for participants and those interested to subscribe to. Um, so that way they can get, um, you know, more direct like communication of when events are happening and, and schedules and stuff that maybe, um, you know, it might hit your hit your inbox and you maybe will pay, see it a little bit better than what's been um, shown before. But that's a great idea. <laughs> great, uh, thank you. Um, we've had a, a few different types of questions come in that I think can be answered by sort of a broad overview about what we do as Bridge. So. Um, I'll ask this question, how, how do you decide uh, who to invite as a Bridge Scholar and what is the nomination process like? I think each pod might do this differently. So I'll speak on what we've been doing in psychology. Um, the group of Bridge subcommittee within Psych um, actually just recently got together to review the nomination process. So we sent out a departmental wide email asking for nominations for bridge scholars. And at this point, um, most of our department members are familiar with what bridge is. Um, we got some nominations and we looked through the different profiles of the scholars who've been nominated while um, acknowledging that diversity is not always um, straightforward or visible. There's a lot of um, non-visible identities that are underrepresented in STEM and um, also considering the kind of work that each scholar engages in. So what kind of um, DEI or advocacy work are they involved with, with or outside of their science? Um, that's something that we really try to consider. And um, yeah, as early career scientists, how would they also benefit from connecting with us and the current faculty that, that are at UMass? So these are all the kind of things that we try to consider um, in a, not really systematic way, but um, we really try to consider these different factors that can't be quantified um, 
no way. Uh, for microbio, we last year hosted a scholar and at the time there were two other microbio graduate students who are on, um, on bridge or in a part of bridge with me. Uh, they're trying to finish up their degrees. So they're, they've stepped back, but, um, for us, we kind of talked about it, uh, the three of us and kind of settled on a list of people that we were interested in inviting. But like Sangha said, you know, there's a lot of different factors that go into it, but overall we're, we're trying to to find people who have, you know, really, at least from my perspective, I'm more interested in their broader impacts than their science particularly. I mean, the science is very important, obviously, but the broader impacts I think is where, where we really stand out, um, where, where Bridge is unique. And then also the, uh, the opportunity for uh, graduate students and, and sometimes undergrads and, and postdocs to interact with these, um, with these scholars, uh, th that's also very important. So you want to kind of figure out or ask a really broad set of questions to kind of narrow down on someone that you might be interested in hosting. And then there's still the chance that you invite them or you, you, you know, reach out to them and they say, no, I'm not, I'm not interested. So it's good to have a kind of a few people in mind when you're going through the process of, of beginning to invite a bridge scholar. Yeah, and I think in environmental conservation, it's it's very it's structured quite similarly to what Sangha and Roseanne said. And and I think one of the things um, to to engage with our departments and stuff, we do um, solicit for nominations, and we remind like every academic year before we we know like for example for the spring we're hosting, and we sent the um, solicitation email a week ago or um, not that long ago, so that way folks have an opportunity. Um, to, to submit names and we populate it into a list. And then it's a matter of the graduate students in the department or who are representative of the department and bridge to take a look at it. But that doesn't also mean that we also um, engage with the other committee members who may be in SES or within our respective program that we can you know, also ask, you know, what do you guys think? Um, because one of the things that Roseanne talked about that I also think is, is the impacts is, is amazing the, what folks are doing. And it's, it's so, um, you know, you're trying to balance um, a lot of things like to what Sangha said of the fit in the department, but then also the impacts and how it could be really interesting for the department and then who they can interact with. And there's a lot of balancing going and then, but then you could invite and then they don't, you know, maybe they're not able to this year. And then it's something that you just might have to note and then be like maybe next year or something. So. There's a lot of talented um, scientists who are on the list and, and there are plenty more, especially with everything going on um, social media with like Twitter, um, you know, like the black and micro weeks and the, you know, other type of, of movements and making to amplify like black scientists voices and, and increasing their visibility. That's definitely a way to um, to take advantage of, of the re, of a growing resource of, of what we have of folks that are doing outstanding work and, and how to support them and how to amplify their work and not just their science work, but their service work as well. Very well said, Nadia. Thanks. <laughs> but otherwise I follow the same, we follow similar processes as they do. <laughs> Could you um, quickly outline what some of the, uh, not necessarily requirements, but kind of guidelines uh, that we use to uh, pick bridge scholars and making sure that they fit in with the bridge model? Um, so I could tackle this. So um, generally uh, what we aim for is three different criteria is one of them being an early career scientist. And we kind of define this as um, a person who hasn't reached tenure yet or hasn't went through the tenure process yet. Um, so that could be uh, you know, a new faculty member or a postdoc to what Roseanne said before too. Um, and then another criteria is that they come from an underrepresented group. And we largely work with the NSF's definition of 
um, who is categorized into that group. Um, and then the third thing, It's Help early Monday morning. <laughs> Help me out. Yeah. There's three, right? Yeah. Or maybe I'm making up three and maybe it's, those are the two large components. I don't remember the third, if there is a third, but it is Monday morning. It is Monday morning. Um, oh, and then like also, um, sorry, it just came up to me. The, one of the, what, what's important also that we've talked about is that they have an, a track record of outstanding impact work. So whether it be, you know, service that they're doing um, within academia, outside of academia, um, impact can look, can look different in many ways. And that's one of the, the real benefits is working with the scholars on what impact means to them too um, and in how they define impact and then they are able to communicate that with us. Um, so that's another, especially because they're gonna be leading that Bridge to Impacts event. If we really need folks who are, who devote and, and have a passion for impacting um, their different communities in different ways. So that's another, another that's the third thing of, of our requirements is just to, that we can see a track record. Thank you. Um, and we have one final question uh, before we'll wrap things up. Um, do we have any data on how Bridge affects the UMass community? Um, and what can we do to amplify and build out the potential impact on the broader UMass community? So I think we have some, some data. Um, I don't know that it's quantitative just because trying to track who's attending, um, like in terms of the participants that are coming to the events, uh, that's been a little bit difficult to track in person. I think online it's easier because we have an idea of who, who's actually here. Um, and we do have a paper that was published talking about the significance of Bridge and some data behind that, that I know Brooke showed some figures from that in her introduction. Uh, so you can check that out. There's a link to it on our website. Um, but we are in the process and interested in gathering the data so that we can sell a stronger story about why we need support and why this is important. Um, but I think the impact is, is broad, but I don't know that we have a way to specifically measure it at this moment, but it's something that we're interested in doing. So if you have suggestions, let us know. Great, thank you panelists. Um, it looks like we are at time. Uh, so thank you everyone for participating and being here. And thank you to the panelists for all your insights and answers. Um, if the attendees have any further questions, uh, feel free to reach out to any of our committee members. You can find us all on the website at blogs.umass.edu backslash bridge. Um, I believe the link was also dropped in the chat. Uh, so feel free to check that out and also follow us on Twitter. Um, and yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.